Um, for those of you who have been to a showcase uh, before, welcome back. Thank you. Um, if you haven't, if this is your first one, um, what we do is we uh, feature three teams uh, who are uh, current or past awardees of our innovation transfer grants. Um, so these are our innovators uh, working to uh, commercialize and implement uh, inventions and business model innovations and products that impact uh, sustainability and uh, energy. And uh, we're always uh, fortunate to have a, a really interesting mix of different products addressing different problems. Today is, is no exception. We have innovators who are working um, in the, the built world that uh, most of us uh, work and live in, and then all the way to innovators who are uh, working in the uh, sort of barren, degraded landscapes uh, in the world, in the natural world as well. Um, so uh, before we, we get started, um, let, me, let me just say that the, the, the main goal is to, is to give these teams a chance to, to tell you about their, their company um, or their product, uh, where they are, where they're going, um, what, they, what they might like uh, in terms of, of help or partnership um, uh, to uh, inspire you, to give you uh, examples of, of teams that are, that are tackling really important problems. Um, and also for, for them to, to make uh, connections uh, as, as much as possible. So to that end, uh, we do have a LinkedIn group that uh, all of our, our speakers are part of. That's a great way, uh, a Tomcat LinkedIn group is a great way to, to connect with them. Um, and we will uh, post that uh, a little bit later in the showcase. Um, before I, I turn it over to our teams, I wanna make two really quick uh, Tomcat specific announcements. Um, the, the first, is that we are um, launching a, a new program just this fall quarter called Tomcat Solutions. This is a program that's gonna run in parallel to, so in addition to our innovation transfer program. Um, basically what it is, it's a, a program where we will support uh, teams uh, through up to three phases of development. Um, so extensive long-term support uh, for teams who are, are working on um, developing solutions to specific problem areas. And, and the two big problem areas that we've highlighted this year are uh, tropical deforestation and uh, the abatement of greenhouse gases, uh, specifically in the developing world. Um, we're really excited about the, this program and the, the potential to uh, sort of uh, direct uh, some of the innovation talent towards these problem areas. Um, the proposals for phase one will open in December. Uh, please reach out to us, look at, uh, connect with our, our website to find out uh, more information. And to synergize with that, um, we are uh, continuing, uh, we're running a, a new season of uh, our Tackling Global Challenges series. Um, this will be a series of Zoom events um, where we engage outside, outside experts to provide uh, insight into um, a particular problem area and, and opportunities to develop new solutions. So uh, last year we had plastics as the theme this year to synergize with Tomcat Solutions. Um, we're focusing this series on tropical deforestation. Um, we've already uh, lined up some, some really phenomenal speakers uh, to provide some, some insight into that, into that problem. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, begin the, uh, the main event here. I'll just do really quick uh, introductions to give our speakers sort of the maximum time uh, to tell us about their companies. Um, the first team we're going to hear from uh, is a company called Bundle. Um, this is uh, Edison Ding and Jana Colucci. Um, Bundle, the, the sort of tagline is a one-stop shop for building materials procurement. Um, so builders save time and money and access um, health and sustainability information. Um, this is a, obviously a, a company that's addressing a, a big problem in the construction industry. Um, the construction industry accounts for, uh, accounted for about 38% of CO2 emissions globally in 2019. So it's a huge uh, footprint. As you'll hear from Bundle, there's um, incredible opportunities to improve efficiency, reduce waste, and, and have a correspondingly big impact. So 
Uh, Jana and Edison, thank you for, for joining us. Great. Thanks for having us. Exciting to be here. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for attending today. We're excited to tell you more about Bundle, our one-stop shop for building materials procurement. I'm Jana Colucci, and I'm our CEO and co-founder. To give you a little bit more background about myself before we get started, I graduated from Stanford GSB in June, but before that worked in design and construction for five years in New York. And during that time, one of my projects was to build my company's headquarters, which was really supposed to be a showcase of healthy, sustainable, innovative building. And while the project was ultimately a success, it really opened my eyes to how fragmented and antiquated the construction industry is. Specifically, I saw that the way that we buy materials greatly limits innovation, and I decided to use business school as a time to step up the construction stack to try to address these systemic problems and ultimately unlock healthier, more sustainable, and more innovative building. Hi, everyone. My name is Edison, and prior to pursuing my MBA at Stanford, I spent about four years in New York working in design and construction as an architect. I led designs for larger scale commercial projects, such as the new Uber headquarters in Mission Bay and an 800 foot tall tower as part of a mixed use project called Hudson Site in Detroit. The process of translating architectural designs to real buildings showed me how much friction and how many inefficiencies there are in the construction process, starting from getting the right building materials on the job site. With Bundle, our goal is to transform how the construction industry buys, sells, and manages materials and improve the way that we build. We're excited to share our vision here with you today. Awesome. So what might surprise you is that 98% of construction projects finish over time and over budget. And the current system of building materials procurement is a major contributing factor, costing builders and owners up to $250 billion annually. To dig into this a little bit more deeply, on every single project, builders spend much of their day researching products, placing orders, and coordinating delivery, which can mean calling tens to hundreds of vendors to get current pricing, lead times, and availability for any of the products that they want to order. And as you may be privy to, COVID has only made lead times and pricing more unpredictable with all of these supply chains. So let's take one of our pilot builders as an example. Brian, who's one of our current customers, should be building on the job site, but instead he needs to manage figuring out pricing and lead times for products. He has to manage payments for all of the products that he's ordering, and he also has to put out fires when products unexpectedly don't arrive on time. He may even lose business because projects become delayed or are so far over budget that people don't want to work with him anymore. Should there be greener, healthy building requirements, Brian dreads this even more because there's more research, more paperwork, and probably more cost involved. However, with Bundle, Brian can really focus on building. Bundle is the first procurement platform that enables builders and suppliers to buy, sell, and manage construction materials from quote to delivery, powered by a two-sided marketplace and project management tools. With Bundle, builders like Brian get access to real-time pricing and lead times all in one place, and they get that information through a few clicks rather than hundreds of calls and emails. On the other side of the marketplace, suppliers benefit from a digitized sales process, custom e-commerce storefronts, and access to data to better predict demand. On Bundle, Brian simply uploads a product order form and our system optimizes for price, lead time, sustainability metrics, or other project goals. Brian can even see price trends for specific products over time, informing him if he should buy now or wait for a better price or lead time. Brian can then check out through Bundle, only paying one vendor rather than dealing with the payment terms of many different suppliers. And on Brian's first project with Bundle, he saved 8% on his project costs and access up-to-date lead time information for almost all of them. Brian's also able to view project information, orders, and tracking status all on a personalized dashboard. Should there be any delays on the project, he has real-time updates rather than finding out about a problem when a product doesn't show up or the wrong product gets delivered to the project site. This also reduces the amount of construction waste and excess carbon footprint that results from misordered or reordered products. On the supplier side, so the other side of the marketplace, manufacturers and distributors are able to pre-populate product information even before an order comes in, allowing them to speed up and simplify the bidding process overall. Bundle's smart quoting tool enables easy communication between suppliers and builders, which really supports existing relationships, but simplifies all of the communication that typically happens. With Bundle, we think of environmental impact through three different buckets. First and foremost, Bundle enables greater transparency throughout the product procurement process, 
which helps builders avoid waste generation through product misorders, overorders, and delivery delays. Leveraging industry research about carbon emissions on construction sites, and specifically emissions resulting from on-site construction, we predict that Bundle can eliminate at least 25% of product order errors. This results in saving an estimated 9 million metric tons of CO2 each year worldwide, and we expect that this could increase from there. Secondly, as an end-to-end -end procurement solution, integration with existing healthy and sustainable material databases is very top of mind. For suppliers, this gives environmentally friendly products a competitive advantage through increased exposure and marketability to a broad network of customers. And maybe even more importantly, on the other side for builders, if all products are purchased through one consolidated platform, sustainability attributes and total project carbon become much easier to calculate. This is something I've experienced firsthand and really hoped that there was a solution for. And lastly, we have longer term dreams of a building materials resale market. Even if products are ordered incorrectly, even through Bundle, Bundle's marketplace infrastructure allows for easy resale of materials rather than scrapping them into a landfill or sending them all the way back to a supplier. So shifting gears a little bit, um, looking at traction, we're currently underway with four builder pilots in three geographic regions, as well as pilots with three national manufacturers. For these pilots, we've evaluated more than $2 million worth of building products and expect our first transactions through the platform in the coming weeks. Through this process, we've also engaged with over 300 product distributors, which has built up our network to quickly get the information we need, even if it isn't pre-populated on Bundle. Broadly, Bundle taps into the $1.3 trillion US construction market. Across the country, most construction is done by the 730,000 small and medium construction companies who don't have robust procurement teams or purchasing power, and as a result are prime users for Bundle. With a 700k average annual product spend per builder, assuming a 5% market penetration and Bundle's 8-10% take rate, Bundle can make at least $2.6 in annual revenue. Within the small medium business segment, we believe that the modular market provides Bundle a key strategic entry point. Primarily, compared with, uh, to traditional subcontractors, modular builders need to manage even more product orders because they take on the roles of many subcontractors under one roof. Through creating buildings and factories, they're essentially a super subcontractor and experience procurement pain points at an even larger scale. Modular builders also tend to seek out technology, making them key early adopters in comparison to other more technology-averse players in the industry. Our product easily serves both modular builders and more traditional builders allowing for a seamless transition to the broader market in the near future. Our go-to-market strategy continues to leverage strategic players, such as owner-operators managing large real estate portfolios and top-down general contractor engagement. In the coming months, we expect customer acquisition to occur through partnerships, warm connections, and highly concentrated industry groups for both builders and suppliers. In terms of our business model, it's twofold. Builders pay a transaction fee when they order products, which is folded into the quoted prices they see on the platform. Suppliers pay SaaS fees for the core platform and additional subscription fees for access to business intelligence and data analytics features. Um, a little bit about our competitors. Bundle's focus is not just on the builders, but we also focus on providing tools to suppliers. Some startups like Reno Run or Curry focus on last minute, last mile delivery, whereas Bundle is focusing on stepping up the construction stack to address the root cause of procurement problems before they happen. There are a few other product marketplaces like Agora or Join, but they focus primarily on builder-focused features and project management tools. Big box retailers such as Home Depot can be fast, but they can be limited in variety because they own their inventory and need to leverage economies of scale. And lastly, we've started to see supplier-focused e-commerce solutions in other industries which we're bringing to construction as a way to get real-time supplier data we need in our marketplace. Currently, we're raising our pre-seed round to grow our engineering team, develop the next version of our product, and move forward with the next stages of our pilots. We're also taking part in both Stardex and OnDeck, which provide us with additional mentors, educational content, and hiring and fundraising support. So in addition to our fundraise, we're working hard on building up our supplier pipeline, talking to leaders of relevant industry groups, and also hiring a front-end engineer. We'd love to talk if you have any of these connections. So during a time when supply chains are more fragile than ever, and we need solutions to minimize waste and reduce our carbon footprint, Bundle can provide an answer. Thank you, and we look forward to your questions. 
Great, thank you, Jenna and, and Edison for a, a really interesting presentation. Congratulations on the, on the early traction you're getting. Um, I, I think I'm gonna start with a, a question from the, uh, from the audience. So uh, the, given the, the long tail on building supplies, how will you populate your supplier list sufficiently uh, to, to really be seen as the one-stop shop for, for procurement management? Yeah, really great question. Happy to take that one. Um, so right now, the way that we're essentially managing that process is twofold. So eventually we want to get to the point where we have all of this data pre-populated on bundle, which really expedites any sort of speed or any sort of pricing information, lead time, any of that straight into the order forms and into the platform on the builder side. Uh, but in addition to doing that with the manufacturer information that we have to date, we essentially have created a digitized bidding process of sorts that really mimics the more manual process that exists in the industry today. And so that allows us to basically still deliver really high quality value and output to those initial builders that we have without having all of that information already built up in our system. Um, so we've actually slowed down the buildup of our builder pipeline right now, really to make sure that we're giving them exactly what they need, delivering high value services again, um, and until we get to that point where we have critical mass on the supplier side. Great, thank you. Um, and, and maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on the on the incentives uh, from the supplier's point of view for, for working with you, particularly some of the, the early adopters here. Yeah, definitely. Happy to talk a little bit about that. So one initial kind of interesting strategic entry point we're taking, which Edison talked a little bit about, is into this modular market or offsite construction. And what basically happens with that is it's people building buildings in factories as opposed to on a construction site. And what's nice about this, um, there's a variety of different reasons, as we mentioned, why we're partnering with them. But what's great about them is that in terms of the supply chain, you're really selling from manufacturer into a factory. And so you don't need as many of the middlemen, typically wholesalers, distributors in between that process. So very interesting kind of initial go to market strategy. Um, beyond that, we do eventually see ourselves competing with distributors and wholesalers in the sense that we're really a tech enabled distributor in a lot of ways. Um, but what incentivizes suppliers to work with us is we can essentially simplify a lot of that process using tech, save some margin for them, and really cut out all these different steps that really complicate the communication process through all those different pieces. And are you going after everything required for, for building a, a, a new unit, or, or is there sort of a subset of the supplies that are particularly well suited to, to this type of platform? Yeah, definitely. We're very focused, at least initially, on what we think of as mid-construction cycle products, which are also of most interest to a lot of these modular builders. Okay. If you picture a typical building being built in a factory, they typically have some IP in the core and shell of the building, okay. but want to provide a lot of variety with the interior finished products or exterior finished products. So flooring, windows, doors, countertops, those sorts of things. So while that's still a very long list of SKUs, it's allowed us to really narrow into some of those product categories, which also happen to be the product categories that have the most opacity in terms of pricing and lead time information. Essentially, the typical process is that anytime you want information about any of those products at a commercial level, kind of above the do-it-yourself type market, you need to essentially put out a bid or go out to bid that then goes through a couple people to eventually bring you back the price and lead time. And so we're really trying to simplify that process. And, and with respect to sustainability, so I, I, how are you going to vet, you know, certain suppliers claiming, you know, certain green credentials for their products versus, versus another? How, how is the quality control for that implemented? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so really leveraging the resources that exist in the market. So actually one of the, the tools that I built prior to coming to business school is a platform called Mindful Materials. Uh, which is a healthy and sustainable product database open to the public, really made to simplify the vetting process that goes into finding the healthiest, most sustainable products and being able to easily compare those. Um, they've continued to advance even since my time there in terms of putting more numbers and embodied carbon and just factors even beyond health and sustainability standards and attributes. And that, as well as some other platforms like EC3, which is very focused on carbon, have APIs that we easily tap into. And so can show you the contrast between products that may not have any of that data with the products that are really leading in the industry. Cool, okay. And maybe I'll end with uh, a somewhat personal question. So you, you both came from uh, construction and building backgrounds. Did you find each other right away at, at GSB or, or how, how did you 
how did you connect to, to launch bundle? Yeah, so um, Jen and I actually serendipitously met through a class called Startup Garage um, over in the business school where um, we found out that we came from similar backgrounds and had a shared passion for improving the industry, um, both stemming from our uh, firsthand frustrations uh, working on certain types of projects. Um, so that was earlier this year. Um, we really liked working with each other and uh, we're both passionate about the idea. So we've been um, full steam ahead ever since. Fantastic. Thank you. So th there are a, a, a number of other questions uh, in the q and I'll, I'll let you um, take those up uh, uh, separately and, and offline. And uh, thanks again for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, so now we're going to uh, switch gears quite quite dramatically from uh, <laughs> construction to to barren landscapes. Uh, so our, our next uh, speaker is Neil Spackman from uh, Regenerative Resources. Uh, the tagline here is rejuvenating degraded landscapes and turning them into ecosystems that attract biodiversity and financial wealth for rural uh, communities. Uh, Neil has uh, a lot of direct experience working in these landscapes in some very unforgiving climates. Um, a surprising fact to sort of set the stage for his uh, presentation, or this is a depressing fact, um, uh, nearly 30 billion tons of fertile soil is lost every year um, over the course of this one-hour talk. That means 3 million tons of fertile soil will be, uh, will be lost. Um, so, uh, Neil, with that backdrop, um, we're excited to hear about uh, regenerative resources. Hey, thanks very much. Um, hey, folks. I'm Neil Spagman. I was an MSX student at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, graduated in 19. And where I essentially incubated what is now regenerative resources. And the we do indeed seek after the most degraded landscapes on the planet, which we'll get into. But I want to start with two really important quotes. Um, hey Neil, could you try to pop it to the, the full screen view? Thank you. How's that? Uh, not quite. And now that's better if you just get rid of this stuff on the right. I don't know if I can get rid of this stuff on the right at the moment. Um, but here we go. There you go. Okay, Great. thanks. Sorry. No, thank you, Matt. Um, first off, there's no path to delivering climate mitigation without investing in nature. We do consider ourselves an ecosystem services company or a nature based solutions company. The second quote uses a term that most people have never heard. Halophytes are crops that grow in seawater, um, of which there are 800 that have commercial viability, almost none of which have been bred or commercialized in any sense of the word as we would think of with typical crops. And um, this is a landscape that we intend to purchase in the next 12 months it's 8,000 hectares on the Pacific coast of Baja California Sur. You can see that there is a cactus ecology that starts about a kilometer off of the ocean. And in this in-between space, you've got highly saline, um, sandy soils on which nothing is living. There's literally no life on this site. We saw a coyote and an osprey in two weeks of staying here. Um, and we are intending to transform it into this. This is a system of seawater-based mangrove agroforestries, constructed mangrove wetlands, driven by effluent from aquacultures. Um, it is a circular regenerative system that increases fresh water, increases biodiversity, sequesters carbon, creates jobs, and produces a wide array of goods from textiles to food to mushrooms and other CPGs. Process flow, I'll go through really quickly, but we start off with aquacultures. Um, we've got experts in shrimp, sea cucumbers, oysters, tilapia, and a number of other fin fish on our team. And typical aquaculture operations, they dump their effluent into the ocean, which creates dead zones. And their feed tends to be one third soybeans, one third wheat paste, and one third bycatch, all of which have their own kind of destructive issues. 
what we're doing is we're starting with aquacultures and we're pumping the effluent through these systems uh, to do mangrove coppice, to do halophytic alley cropping. This is where we're growing crops in seawater, alley cropped with mangrove trees as a version of integrated pest management. Um, and the last place where that water flows is in constructed mangrove wetlands, where we can produce a wide variety of goods um, using multi-trophic aquacultures. The best thing about this is we have a number of feeds in development where the aquacultures grow the forests and we can actually grow the feed for our aquacultures in these same forests. So it is a contained closed loop circular regenerative system. Um, here are some of the products that we have grown in the past on different iterations of this. Um, fin fish and shrimp, as well as sea cucumbers and oysters. We were the first in the world to grow edible mushrooms on halophytic crop residues, algae, including both macro and micro algae. Um, and here's the estimated impact per 500 hectares of this system. And our first iteration, we start, which was done in Eritrea from 2000 to 2004 by my partners. Um, we started with 20 something birds on site and within four years we had about 250 species of birds living on site. Um, and significant impact across a wide variety of different metrics. Applications here are really pretty shocking. Um, we are in the process of uh, talking with EFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, which is a UN body to send a task force to, um, to Madagascar. Madagascar is facing massive famine and drought right now because they aren't able to grow crops. Um, we're talking with them to send a task force to start growing seawater crops, which are we are never going to run out of seawater. It is an infinite resource, and we can grow food without any fresh water whatsoever. Fodder and feed is a really big deal in places like the Horn of Africa, in places like in uh, Madagascar, um, Senegal, Mauritania, Namibia, et cetera, where we can essentially increase the food security of countries that are prone to famine and drought. Um, we can produce all sorts of stuff with seawater aside from the animal fodder. And in places like these where food security is so critical, this is a, a massive solution. Biodiversity is a big one, but also this is a system that we think can actually adapt to sea level rise because mangroves are capable of growing between five and 15 millimeters of soil a year. Um, and then they're also a massive protector against hurricanes, against storm surges, and at the same time, they're massive for fishery sustainability. Uh, it's estimated that one third of all species in the ocean rely on mangroves during some part of their life cycle. And we have lost over a third of mangroves on the planet since the 1970s. All right, so this climate and environment is a, uh, a huge piece of this and a huge motivator for us. We are integrating macroalgae and microalgae into these systems, um, which show major promise in the development of other industries such as bioplastics, biopolymers. And then cooling and greening. This is a helicopter photo of our first iteration in Eritrea. On this system, we did cool the local climate by two degrees Celsius um as a function of this regenerative seawater system so it's got wide applicability we've we estimate there's about 15 million hectares globally where we could build these systems and are doing so in a number of places here's a project we're going after in spain this is not mangrove based this is marsh restoration uh, this is the river in cadiz it is a very salty river because the, the tides here are, are about five and a half meters. And so about 100 kilometers upriver, you have very salty water. This used to be a marsh 
They built dikes around it. You can see that it's a totally it's a totally barren landscape, extremely salty, almost nothing grows on there. We intend to convert it into a multi-trophic aquaculture system that includes halophytic crops. Um, this is that's probably going to be our first project in Spain. Spain is facing huge issues with desertification, and there are thousands of hectares of degraded land where we could build these kinds of multi-trophic systems. This is the one in, uh, in Mexico that I already showed you. The numbers on this is that if we integrate the carbon and the real estate gain, it's a, about an $80 million project with an IRR of 18 to 20% over the first 10 years. The, how do we make money? It's kind of four different ways of value creation. The sale of goods off of the sites. Uh, carbon is a very big one for us, particularly in uh, the projects we're doing in Africa. Uh, the real estate gain is extremely significant. It's, it's kind of mind blowing numbers when we're able to integrate real estate into the business model. And then fourth, this transformation of land allows for all sorts of ancillary activities to happen, whether it's ecotourism or medical tourism um, or similar kinds of things. When you, when you transform a landscape from something like this to something like that, people want to come see it. It's, it's We've experienced it every place we've done this. And um, that's kind of what we're up to right now. We have projects underway in Spain, Ghana, Namibia, and Mexico. We just secured permits in Mexico. And a, uh, I got to be careful what I'm allowed to say here in public. We have permits to do our first site and encouragement from Mexico's EPA that they are going to study this with an eye towards expanding it across multiple states within the country. Um, and that's where we are right now. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Neil. That was uh, fascinating and uh, uh, almost too good, too good to be true at, at times. Uh, so some of the, uh, all the benefits uh, added together really seem uh, remarkable. So I, a, a lot to, um, to ask about. Um, I, I guess first, just these designs for these, um, for these whole systems, w where did those come from? And, and, and how have those been sort of, you know, validated and, and refined so that it, you, you have a pretty clear idea of exactly how much land you need for each part and how it's all going to work together. How, how does that? Um, so that we are the pioneers of this system. My partner, Ned Doherty, built and directed and designed the first system like this, which was done in Eritrea. He's been working on this for over 30 years. The concept was developed by a scientist named Carl Hodges, who um, was, he passed away earlier this year. He was our senior science advisor and kind of passed the baton of these systems on to us. But there have been multiple failed efforts at establishing these um, around the globe, including in Mexico before with Carl Hodges in Saudi Arabia. So there have been a lot of lessons learned and um, a lot. The one successful attempt was Eritrea. They had 800 employees. They had tripled their income. They were exporting two tons of shrimp to the EU every month. Um, they did initial measurements on carbon sequestration and biodiversity, and it was too successful for their own good because in 2004, the Eritrean Navy showed up, seized the operations, and gave my partners 48 hours to leave the country because uh, they thought it was going to be a cash cow for them. Wow. And, and so when you, um, when you first, so you start with the aquaculture, is that yes. is that right? And and so that um, and then and then that will support the the mangrove trees and then those feed back into the aquaculture. So so how long does it take to get to sort of a self sustaining system? I mean, it's, certainly you would have to you have to bring feed in for the it's first. It's a four years. to five year process. On, okay. on that side I showed you, we're going to grow forty five million forty five million mangroves. Okay. And it takes some time to get that many trees in the ground. Okay, and then and then all of that that can supply sufficient feed for the aquaculture? For the aquacultures, yes. Okay, and then basically they fertilize the, the mangroves and it's, it's all a closed system? That's it, that's it. The, the limit to growth on that system 
in these landscapes, particularly the arid landscapes, is the nitrogen and phosphorus. Right. In a delta like, you, like we have in Ghana, that's not so much of an issue, so you get much faster growth rates. But on, in a place like Baja California, Seward, there's no nutrient in the land whatsoever. And so it, it is using the aquaculture effluent as the source of that fertility and the source of that nutrient instead of dumping it into the ocean, which is standard practice. Okay. And, and do you worry about, about sort of diseases in these, in these closed systems? Or, or yes. Yeah. Um, white spot is a, is a really big issue with shrimp. The, I am not an expert in the aquacultures, but we have really phenomenal people with decades of experience on our team doing this kind of thing. My role as a CEO or as a designer is more of a choreographer, right? Because each one of those systems has separate management and we can hire people who know how to manage each system. For us, it's choreographing the connections between those, making sure that the outputs of one function as the inputs of the next. Okay. And can you speak a little bit more about, about your team and, and how you see that sort of uh, growing as the business grows? Yeah, we have, um, our plan is to keep our US team very small. We currently have um, a team of seven in the US, which is kind of our core. We have a dozen people on our Mexico team, and our CSO came from Mexico. Uh, she's a, a, a world expert in multi-trophic aquacultures who's coming out of Sibnort. Um, we have a team of about a dozen in Europe from a company that we just acquired called Seawater Solutions. We have a team of 20 in Ghana. And the idea is to everywhere we go, we are cooperating and partnering with local communities. And our intention is to maximize local labor and, and local expertise as much as possible. The, and then it's our job to fill in the gaps, right? Of what, what knowledge isn't there. So in Eritrea, our, our country director has 15 years experience doing tilapia aquacultures and tilapia has a massive market in Ghana. They love that stuff over there. Um, and so it's about finding the right expertise locally, putting together the right teams locally, and then working with them to institute the primary system, and then expansion happens from there. Okay. And, and if you sort of, you know, think forward 10 years, um, what sort of scale uh, are you targeting 10, 10 years from now in terms of hectares or whatever metric you want to use? Our, um, well, I've, I've committed to myself that we're going to grow a billion mangroves before I retire. Okay. Um, we will, in 10 years, we'll have expanded in Latin America. We'll be in at least three states in Mexico. We'll probably be in La Guajira in Colombia. I mean, we're already in talks with Senegal, Mauritania, Mozambique, Somaliland, Egypt, Oman, the Emirates, Northwestern India. The last place we'll end up is Australia because we're going to have to automate our systems before we go there because cost of labor is so high. But we intend to be global within 10 years quite and, and quite quickly at that. Fantastic. Uh, thanks so much for, for sharing this uh, vision, really, really exciting story. Um, please check the, the Q&A. There's a number of, uh, of additional questions for you. Sure. There. Thank you for, for being with us. Um, who's? All right, we've got Elisa asking, do we plan to build a product brand across yeah. our projects? Yes, eventually. I'll, so I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you answer those uh, uh, offline. Uh, Great. You, know, you just you can uh, type. So I'll read the question out loud for other folks. It says, do we plan to build a product brand across our projects? How many projects do we envision in next years? So the, it's going to take just as much time to go from zero to one project as it will to go from one to 10 and as it will to go from 10 to 100. Um, because we're going to get better and better at it and we're going to be able to train people we'll be able to bring them to the nuclei sites each project is telling the same story of regeneration eventually we will have a food brand we're starting out just wholesaling um, because it's it's more work than we want to handle to try to vertically integrate across the whole supply chain at the beginning 
But eventually the story is so powerful. It gives hope and inspiration to everybody we talk to about it. And eventually we are gonna want a brand that tells that story and represents that kind of transformation we want. Um, yeah, I, I think that the future you're gonna get tapped to do terraforming at some point <laughs> for the, the Mars mission is the, is the ultimate horizon. <laughs> I, I don't know, we'll see, we'll see. Okay. Um, Laura asked. Sorry, Neil. Thank you. We, we just. Oh, we got to stop. Yeah, Good we got to move on to our to our last uh, our last speaker. But thanks so much. Uh, this is thanks, really folks. really amazing. Okay, our uh, our final um, uh, team today is uh, Velix uh, Computing, and we're joined by uh, Jason Poon. This is a uh, we're back to the to the built world. Um, uh, this is a software accelerator platform. Um, for advanced analytics and computation that enables more intelligent, resilient, and secure industrial systems. Um, just as a, a fun fact to set the stage uh, for Jason's presentation, um, if you look in the upper Midwest, uh, the average person loses power annually for about an hour and a half, um, whereas in Japan, the average person loses power for about four minutes per year. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Jason to tell us about Velix. Great. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. So hi, everyone. It's, it's really great, uh, to, great to be here. I'm Jason Poon. I'm a visiting scholar here in the EE department. Um, and also co-founder of our venture uh, that we call Velix Computing. And again, super excited to be here to give you an overview of, of what we've been up to. So um, as, as Matt mentioned, the, the really the central challenge that we're trying to address here is the fact that operating and maintaining electric grids today is more critical, more complicated, and more important than ever before. And you know, I don't have to go through all of the recent events in the news that have really highlighted this, whether they're the, the wildfires out here in California or you know, events in Texas or, or in Florida that have shown that you know, the, the, the reliability and re resiliency of our electric grid is, is really critical and really impacts the lives of, of millions and millions of people around the world. So there, there are a lot of things that we wish our electric grid could do automatically to prevent these problems. Uh, and I've listed a laundry list of them here. So, so for example, wouldn't it be great if, if the grid could you know, just automatically detect faults and anomalies and then automatically reconfigure to ensure that the power would never go out? Or, or wouldn't it be great if we could detect where and when uh, wildfires are most likely to occur and then modify how the power flows to reduce the likelihood of starting one. And what really underpins this list of things is, is the reliance on computing. So not only having the, the algorithms to do these things, but also having the necessary computing capabilities exactly where they're needed. And unfortunately, we think this poses a big challenge for the grid today because if you look at how the grid is set up, it often looks something like this. So the infrastructure is extremely distributed and often in locations that are very remote. So if we think about our ability to do the really advanced computing that we need in these types of settings, then there's a number of very obvious pitfalls. So the first is that you know, given that these locations are very remote, connecting to the cloud could be really challenging. And this is a problem because a lot of services today uh, that companies offer rely heavily on the cloud. So getting a bunch of data from these locations that are very remote to the cloud can be really difficult. And also there are a lot of uh, security and privacy issues moving data off site that our customers are really concerned and cautious about as well. So that's, that's the first problem. Second, if you want to keep everything local, the computing resources that you have at these, you know, at these, for instance, at these transformer substations, 
you may know that the equipment for the grid is often designed to last decades. So you're dealing with these legacy industrial PCs that absolutely weren't designed to run the latest and greatest machine learning or, or optimization based algorithms that we need them to. So our company is on a mission to address this problem. And towards that end, we have developed what we call the Velux Acceleration Platform. So our core technology is a computing accelerator for industrial systems uh, that enables up to 100x acceleration in compute performance. And importantly, it's compatible with existing deployed infrastructure. And this means that our customers don't need to rip and replace anything and can instead retrofit their existing compute assets. Uh, and this really results in substantial CapEx uh, reductions. So our platform is designed to uh, be installed in a variety of edge compute hardware and operating systems. Uh, so for instance, uh, PLCs or data historians or industrial PCs. And we work with our customers to develop these apps that provide the functionality that they want. So these could be apps for predictive maintenance, for fault and anomaly detection, for wildfire detection, so on and so forth. And these apps will leverage our accelerator technology, the accelerator core, to run on these legacy hardware platforms. So our accelerator is based on technology that uh, came, uh, came out of Stanford. And uh, we have uh, this, this hardware prototype uh, here on the left that has validated some of these acceleration capabilities for a, a specific class of nonlinear optimization problems. Uh, we also have a, a white paper and a couple patents that are making their way through um, the Office of Technology Licensing. And we're also negotiating an exclusive licensing agreement with OTL that uh, should be in place very soon. Something that's interesting about our technology is that it can be realized as either a piece of software or as a piece of hardware. So we can package the accelerator as a SaaS solution that our customers can deploy on any bare metal hardware. And this will provide somewhere in the range of five to 10X performance acceleration. Or we can package this as a piece of hardware, something uh, in the form of a, of a PCIe card or, or a USB stick that our customers can plug into their existing uh, computing hardware. And this would provide the most acceleration up to 100X. So really our technology is one aspect of how our product uh, is really differentiated from, from existing solutions on the market. So we're able to bring that advanced computation that conventionally happens exclusively in the cloud and bring it to the edge where the data is, is most readily available. And you know, we can offer a product that has much lower latency and lower operating costs uh, for our customers. And beyond the utility space, we're, we're also really excited about the broader edge compute market, uh, which today is nearly $700 billion in, and growing rapidly. Um, and, and this growth you know, is really driven by growth, not only in, in the smart grid technology space, but also in a variety of industries, including industrial IoT, smart manufacturing, traffic management, EV charging infrastructure, and so on. And, and we believe that these verticals could potentially really expand our, our TAM and we're, we're actively exploring pilots in a number of these areas. So, so speaking of pilots, we, we're, we're excited to say that we're actually engaged uh, with, with one pilot uh, with a company called Dynamic. Uh, they're, they're an edge, edge operating system company uh, located out here in, uh, in Menlo Park. Uh, and with them, we're aiming to demonstrate a, a live prototype of our technology uh, with a community owned utility company in Florida. And in addition, we have five additional pilots in our pipeline that we're, we're aiming to start in, in this next six, six months or so. So in, in order to capitalize on, on these markets, we, we envision having three revenue streams. So we're, we'll, we want to monetize our, our accelerator platform uh, with, a, with a usage based pricing model. Uh, and, and we'll also provide turnkey solutions uh, and also license our IP to, to end users and also supply chain customers. 
Um, and our, our go-to-market plan uh, consists first of deploying these, these paid pilots and field trials with our supply chain customers. And then we'll launch on a beachhead market and then subsequently scale uh, once we've reached something like tier 9 level validation. Uh, we've also shown here what uh, our forecasted revenue looks like for the next uh, five years. And this is the team that's making it happen. Uh, so you know, I think we have a really unique blend of technical and business expertise that's needed to bring this technology to market. Uh, so we have over 20 combined years of work experience in the power and energy sector, including uh, experience in, in, in the utility space. And we also have a business expertise leading and operating uh, B2B companies. So, we, so I think we have some, some sense of the challenges of selling into these enterprise and regulated industries. So uh, with that, uh, you know, I, th I think we're all really excited about the next steps and we'd love to connect with you if you're curious to learn more. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jason. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start uh, just with some, a little bit more uh, questions about the, um, about the technology itself. So it seems that you're, you're focused on the sort of power and energy industry early on, at least as, as sort of the initial target market. Can, can you walk me through a edge computation that, that can't be done now, that isn't done now, of course, at a transformer substation that, that, that this would really unlock that, that would sort of impact the power and energy industry? Sure, sure. So, so the big one in the in the space, you know, if you talk about a transformer substation, really the a big application today is in predictive maintenance, okay. and around that, you know, it's basically looking at the hardware that you have and trying to anticipate failures, say, in a transformer before it happens. Um, and a lot, or, or some of those methods today, use uh, machine learning, but the challenge is that in order to train and build these machine learning models, they need to send a bunch of operating data um, from the, the, the operation of this transformer, whether that's voltage, current, temperature, vibration data to the cloud. And this could be gigabytes and gigabytes of data over the course of, of months in order to really characterize the operation of the normal, you know, this is what the transformer operation looks like under a normal situation versus this is an anomaly, this is something that's not expected. So today that process happens exclusively in the cloud. And, you know, as I mentioned in a lot of scenarios, that's, that's simply something that's not feasible, right? You have locations that are extremely remote. Uh, you don't have, a, you know, a very secure or, or, or high bandwidth connection to the cloud. So, a lot of times it's just infeasible to deploy these types of techniques. So you would, you would provide the, the hardware at the substation that would do the computation right there? Exactly, then, exactly. Okay. So we, we, would, we would leverage existing uh, computing at the, at, the, at the location itself, and we, we could do these things locally, exactly. Is, is that uh, similar to what you're doing in this, in this first pilot, or, or is the first pilot sort of targeting a different application? No, that, that, that's exactly, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, th that in addition to, to other things, but that, I think that's one of the, the first key things that we, we aim to address. Okay. And just a couple of, of uh, technical questions from the, from the audience. So um, the first is, uh, what are the bandwidth requirements from edge to cloud at, at some of these remote locations? Again, I, I, that, I, that would really depend on the type of, of application um, that is being implemented. Um, for a lot of uh, vision-based applications, so, so where there's actually, you know, where you're processing pictures or, or video data, you know, you could require pretty substantial connection to the cloud. Um, other times there are ways that you could potentially reduce the, the amount of data that you're sending um, and, and what, whether that's, you know, again, voltage or current or temperature information that perhaps doesn't update as frequently, but it, it really depends on, um, on the exact, you know, application that's being implemented. And, and how many of these systems have you produced so far? You showed, you showed, is that that one hardware prototype is, was the first prototype or it, what are the issues with sort of um, manufacturing these on a, on a large scale? 
That, that, that's a that's a fantastic point. That's a fantastic point. So so we have developed a, a hardware prototype to to validate the core IP. Uh, as I mentioned, the technology is amenable to both a software implementation and a hardware implementation. So our our initial go to market plan initially is to really focus on the software version of of this um, of, of this technology because we think that would uh, first allow us to to validate what our, our value proposition. And also iron out, um, you know, any any problems that we come across with, with, with the technology. Um, in, in developing the hardware, you know, that's obviously a much longer a development cycle. Uh, you know, we could, you, you know, you could potentially even envision something that would be, uh, you know, implemented as as an integrated circuit, we're, we're, and that, that would, you know, you're talking about, you know, years of development there. So we do envision a, a staged cycle where, where we're fo focus, focusing first on a software realization of this and then transitioning to, to something in hardware. Um, so, I, so I hope that answers the question. And, yeah. and we have we have live prototypes of, of the software that, that's working and okay. um, that, that we're actively developing. Yeah, it sort of relates to my, my next question. So in terms of, of growing your team, so then you're focused mostly on sort of the software engineering component on the on the technical side, or is there what are your needs for for growing the team uh, sure so exactly as a soft so software engineering is one component but also another big component that we're looking at or are seeking to address is you know in selling to a lot of these um, regulated or, or regulated industries or for really any any b2b industry is that I think it's important to have or it is important to have um, you know, somewhat of a reputation in the field. You know, it's, you know, it's very difficult to sell into some of these industries sometimes. So we're, you know, trying to to work with um, or, or find people who have experience in in this space and are familiar with the sales cycles of of some of these, you know, utility companies or or other businesses that we want to work with, uh, because that's definitely a, a something that uh, we want to de-risk you know and it's definitely a challenge as a, as a young or as a small b2b uh, business mm -hmm. and, and then sort of last question but you know beyond utilities and, and power and energy what's what's sort of the next target industry um for for this type of technology and, and you know that's a great question and that's something we're, we're actively exploring so, so again if if you know anyone in the audience has has thoughts or or, or is, is interested in in you know, talking more, we, we'd love to, to hear from you and I'd happy to, to be connect, uh, to, to connect with you. Um, Terrific. Okay, th thank you, Jason, for, uh, for sh uh, sharing Velux with us. Um, I wanna thank all of our uh, participants uh, one more time. Uh, it's a really fascinating mix of uh, exciting new technologies. Um, uh, any of you who, who didn't have a chance to ask a question or didn't get your, your question answered, um, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, either try to connect directly with our participants. I'm sure they would love to uh, to talk with you offline uh, or connect through the Tomcat uh, LinkedIn uh, group site um, or uh, contact uh, any of us on the Tomcat team. Uh, so uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon, and uh, we look forward to another uh, Innovation Showcase uh, next quarter. Thanks so much.